This is Lola. I am the Harvard site coordinator for New England MHTTC. Um, so feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. And as you may know, this is a collaboration between uh, Mass Mental Grand Rounds and New England MHTTC. So I just want to go over a few housekeeping items before we begin. Participant microphones have been muted at entry, and you'll be able to unmute them during the discussion portion. During the presentation, if you have any technical difficulties or questions about the topic, please use the chat box. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing at a later time on the website. I will also send out the recording to all participants. Um, to reach us after the webinar, you can email us at uh, New England, sorry, uh, New England at mhttcnetwork.org. One, one minute, let me just get to the next slide over here. Okay. Also, at the end of the month, we will send you a certificate of completion that you can submit to your particular board for continuing education credit. If you have any questions about receiving CEs, please contact ifisher at c4innovates.com for more information after the event. This is just an MHTTC C, uh, acknowledgement slide. The MHTTC network uses affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all activities. That language is strengths-based and hopeful, inclusive and accepting of diverse cultures, genders, perspectives, and experiences, healing-centered and trauma-responsive, and inviting to per uh, individuals participating in their own journeys, person-first and free of labels, non-judgmental and avoiding assumptions, respectful, clear, and understandable, and lastly, consistent with our actions, policies, and products. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. K. Siobhan for introductions. Thank you, Lola, and good afternoon, everyone. It's my distinct pleasure on behalf of um, New, the New England Mental Health Technical Transfer Center and the Massachusetts Mental Health Center uh, to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Frank Detilio, Detilio, uh, who is a practicing clinical psych and forensic psychologist um, He's not, new, uh, he's not new to us at Harvard. He for previously on the faculty at uh, the Harvard Medical School for 14 years and uh, currently is Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, where he has taught for the last uh, 35 years. Um, he is widely published with over 300 professional publications and 23 books, which have been translated into 30 languages and uh, which are used in 80 different countries. He has lectured on every continent except Antarctica and is the recipient of numerous awards for outstanding achievement in the fields of psychology and psychotherapy. So uh, he is going to be speaking today uh, to us about this very important uh, topic, which is probably more important than ever before in the pandemic era on how we take care of ourselves in, in, uh, in, in this world, in this uh, professional world and in our personal worlds, the self-care of mental health professionals. So with that, uh, Dr. D'Artilio, um, please uh, take, uh, take it away. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kashavan. I appreciate it. And it's an honor to be back and uh, lecture the, the Harvard and Massachusetts community. Uh, so uh, we, uh, have an, only an hour or less than an hour today, but uh, we'll try to make uh, uh, truncate this as uh, easy as I can. I may have a little bit more slides, but most of them are self-explanatory. Um, and if uh, it's the lunch hour, so please feel free to enjoy your lunch. Uh, you can uh, uh, chew as loud as you'd like. I think you're muted, so nobody's going to hear you. Um, so look, first of all, give yourself a round of applause because you're doing something important for yourself. We're not going to talk about therapeutic interventions or clinical uh, approaches today. We're going to talk about us as mental health professionals, but us as, as human beings. And the fact that uh, uh, we need to focus on our own health care amidst uh, much of what we do. Next slide. Um, so... In, in terms of what we do, along with air traffic controllers, police firefighters, and members of professional bomb squads, mental health professionals have one of the most stressful professions in the world. I don't have to tell you that. You know that firsthand. And the longer that you've been 
in the field, the more that impact uh, hits home. Next. Um, we deal with some of the most challenging people in society. And in case you haven't noticed, the world's gotten a little wackier in the last few years, more than it's ever been. Uh, the, the, the tragedies and the stressful things that go on uh, are at, at a, a all time high. And what strikes me is some of the things that used to be uh, abnormal are now normal. I, after driving the Schuylkill Expressway in Philadelphia for 40 years in the morning, if somebody doesn't give me the finger, I get really upset. And that's not right. That's odd. And But it's the case of the fact that our world is different. We deal with psychotic disorders, aggression and anger problems at a higher rate now than ever, severe anxiety, suicidal, homicidal behavior, severe personality disorders, marital and family distress, bipolar disorders, not to mention dealing with third party payers, which sometimes is one of the most challenging. Next. So not only are we exposed to all of this stress in psychopathology, we're expected to understand it, explain it, and in some cases, ameliorate it through our work as mental health clinicians. Next. So after years of conducting intensive assessments and treatment with such severely disordered individuals, uh, the uh, psychological impact on us as human beings can often be profound. Sometimes it's very insidious uh, and we're not even aware of how it affects us, but it does. Next. Most of us have been drawn to a mental health professional because of our fascination with psychological process in the human condition. And it's our internal and genuine passion for helping other people and doing uh, to making the world a better place than we found it. Uh, God knows that we haven't gone into this field for financial reasons. Uh, we certainly are probably on the lower end of the totem pole of uh, uh, financial remuneration. We do it because we care about humanity. But being having these vulnerabilities to this career choice also makes us vulnerable to some of the uh, stressors uh, that. Uh, we often need to treat in other people. Next. So let's consider some alarming facts. Uh, during the course of his illustrious career, Sigmund Freud suffered from the following. He admitted that he had frequent blackouts, mild agoraphobia, a serious, a, a serious addiction to cocaine, and he also refused to quit smoking after 30 surgical procedures on his jaw from nicotine he was also a self-proclaimed neurotic, and those were his words, not mine. Next. There's been some debate as to whether or not he actually committed suicide. I don't know for sure whether that was the case, but many feel that he did by just neglecting his own self-care. Uh, Bruno Bettelheim, another uh, prominent figure, child psychologist, when he found out that he had cancer, he put a bag over his head and suffocated himself. Lawrence Kohlberg, Willem Steckel, Victor Talk, Again, a number of people who uh, had, had taken their life. And one of the most recent, Michael Mahoney, who was a cognitive behavioral constructivist therapist. Next. Um, he was uh, hospitalized uh, for exhaustion and stress due to fatigue and pneumonia, but he admitted that he had been, it was a direct work uh, result of a harrowing schedule of traveling and lecturing and clinical work. And uh, he, eventually, he eventually succumbed to that pressure and took his life. It's very sad when mental health professionals do that because we expect they should you know, have more insight, but they're as human as anyone else. Next. So two major research studies examined stress-related symptoms in mental health trainees. These were students who were going, or residents who were going to school. And in a general health questionnaire, the survey of 281 mental health professionals actively working in the United Kingdom, 59% uh, of them reportedly uh, reported clinically significant distress due to their work-related activities. 75% reported moderate to high stress levels uh, as they were experiencing their residency and clinical training. Next. A more recent survey in Australia, about 73% of clinicians reported clinically significant levels of distress among mental health professionals in general. Next. 
in recent study for the American Psychological Association, they polled 260 members were surveyed about stressors that affect them in their professions. Most frequently areas reported were burnout. Burnout is more than just fatigue. You have to have the element of apathy. Um, that you just aren't having a very positive attitude about your work um, and it's in, in interfering with their functioning. Countertransference, another for many of the psychodynamic people understand uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we have a negative uh, response or others have a bad response to us. Uh, vicarious traumatizations, the individuals who work with uh, crisis situations are starting sometimes to take on some of the same symptoms that the people that they're treating are complaining of. I just spent days in the Ukraine and Poland virtually helping mental health professionals in both Poland and Ukraine deal with this very fact that they were burning out very quickly because of the 3 million plus refugees that were coming in all had mental health uh, problems. Um, once a few male psychologists told me that she had a young girl, 15 years old, and from the Ukraine, her village was bombed. She was one of the only survivors. Uh, she lost all of her family. And then to make matters worse, she was uh, uh, assaulted and raped by uh, intruders and became pregnant with one of the uh, perpetrators, uh, a child. And she just thought that the only way out was for her to take her life. Uh, they hopefully, uh, successfully they intervened and they saved her from doing that. But the psychologist said to me that she just was devastated in working with this young child and had anxiety about it herself because it also reminded, the young lady also reminded her of her niece. So teaching them how to prepare themselves and inoculate against these horrible, horrible stories uh, is, uh, is very important because they are trying to do their job, but at the same time, they're suffering from the same symptoms. Personal losses, medical problems that we have, problems with collecting fees, conflicts with coworkers, all these are areas that individuals complained about in the survey. Next. This, in the same study, they asked participants about their experiences with psychotherapy. And the results indicated that about 86% reported that they uh, uh, failed to receive psycho, they did receive some psychotherapy at some point in their lives, but 59% admitted that there were times when they really could have benefited from it during the time that they were treating and they failed to seek it. Why did they do that when we promote that as part of what we do? And we're gonna answer that question a little bit down the road. Next. Suicide has become a prevalent problem among mental health professionals with rates that are described at exceeding that of the general population, particularly now subsequent to the COVID, it's gotten much worse. In, in a 2022 study shows that the rates are high, particularly among psychologists. In rare cases, the stress of working in the field of uh, mental health may lead to even secondary type of personality disorders, or even in, in some case, rare cases, psychotic disorders. Next. So here's some additional facts. Three out of four therapists have experienced major distress within the past three years. The principal cause was relationship problems. More than 60% have suffered clinically significant depression at some point in their lives. Nearly half admitted that during the weeks following a personal crisis, they were unable to deliver the quality of care to their patients that was desired. And mental health professionals portray a chronic disregard for their own self-care. So we can say, isn't this hypocritical? Yes, but there's a reason behind it. Next. Individuals particularly who work with post-traumatic stress disorder often mm -hmm. develop the same type symptoms themselves as some of the people in the Ukraine, the mental health professionals in Ukraine have complained, withdrawal from family and friends, emotional numbing uh, or compassion fatigue, loss of interest in everyday pleasure, preoccupation with clients' problems, physical symptoms, insomnia, even sexual dysfunction. Next. And the same hold true for even forensic experts or clinicians who do assessment and deal with civil criminal cases and trauma. 
Those who work with harsh criminal matters or circumstances such may experience burnout or a numbing effect to uh, deaths, abuse, trauma, suicide, and either other life experiences. Next. So it's not uncommon that a vast majority of mental health professionals admit incidences of working with too distressed, that they were working when they were too distressed themselves to be effective. And nearly all of the individuals in the aforementioned study who were surveyed acknowledged that they were aware of the fact that doing so was un, uh, unethical. Next. The Latin phrase, cura te ipsum, take care of yourself. So we promote self-care to our clients, but put our own needs on the shelf. And again, many people say that, isn't this hypocritical? Next. So when you've flown in a jet, uh, you always have the in-flight instructions and they come on and they say that in the event of cabin depressurization, oxygen mass will lower from the ceiling. If you're traveling with an elderly person or a young child, what do they tell you to do? Put the oxygen mass on yourself first. Why? Because if you're not awake, you can't help anyone else. And that's a good mantra for us to remember about our own self-care. Next. Now, reasons why mental health professionals are resistant to self-care. Uh, and these are speculative because we don't have a lot of good research in this area, but it certainly is an area that needs to be pursued. Savior complex or Messiah complex, you've heard that term before. The cognitive distortion that we have is to serve as many people as we can at the cost of even our own self-sacrifice. Or avoidance. We know we are vulnerable, but consciously we just don't go there. We ignore it, somehow deluding ourselves that we'll be able to make it because we're strong and durable and this is what we have to do. Or outright denial, the defense mechanism, which is a lot more complex, of that level of blindness and uh, Bierce in a 2013 study found that a lot of it, it, mental health it, professionals had admitted to this. The underlying fear of being determined to be incapacitated or incompetent. So they don't admit that they themselves are overwhelmed or burned out. And the last that I find a lot of is the lack of uh, collegial assiduity, which is really when colleagues do observe it in other colleagues, but they fail to confront them, obviously because it's uncomfortable, they may be met with the rebuke, or it'll affect the relationship. So they become complacent and, and because it's uncomfortable or awkward and they just don't go there. Next. We need to be optimal in our functioning because we draw so much from ourselves to serve as an instrument of our work with others. Next. So ask your, ourselves this question. What attracted me to the field of mental health profession in the delivery of service? In what ways are these factors a source of both strength as well as vulnerability? What do I find most fulfilling and most successful in my daily work? And do I pace myself appropriately? Next. What are some of the healthy, positive, less or less healthy and negative coping strategies that employ with my own life? Do I utilize them? particularly the same ones that I profess to the ones that we treat? How do I prioritize self-care activities compared to the demands of my work? You know, you get good at what you do and you're in demand and you get busier and busier and it's hard to say no. And some, before you know it, you found yourself overwhelmed. So what is the method for intervening and pacing ourselves? And what are the personal and professional uh, uh, costs of delaying my self-care? I found this during the pandemic that we had so many health professionals that were ex experiencing anxiety and stress and they would, you know, wanted to be seen. And they said, you know, I, I want to see you. I don't want to see anybody else. And it's, it's overwhelming. And so, you know, we struggle with the fact of rejecting and uh, disappointment and we need to, again, focus on what our limits are next. So adequate personal coping style. Do we have one? 
And do we have a mechanism for determining when we're overwhelmed? Unrealistic beliefs and expectations about our ability to handle stress. You know, do we delude ourselves so that we're stronger than uh, everybody else? And lack of collegial and, and personal support, which is very, very important. Next. Too large of a caseload. You know, what is the recommended caseload? I think the American Psychological says any association says anywhere from 24 to 28 clients per week. But if many of those are very high uh, uh, risk patients, uh, whether through suicide or uh, they're, uh, you know, severely uh, mentally ill or uh, handicapped, this may re require us to reduce our caseloads. Too many challenging cases. I'll never forget many, many years ago, my 40-year-old son, who was five at the time, and I had to take him to the office with me one morning because my wife had to go somewhere and we didn't have anybody to watch him. And so I decided to take him along with me and I put him in a toy room next to me. So when I was done, I could you know, be with him. And I was seeing the Flintstones that morning. I had this family that was screaming and yelling and hollering at each other, making a lot of noise. And um, after I was finished, uh, he, you know, I got, went and got him and he said, uh, that is, is this what you do at work? And I said, yeah, it's what I do. And he said, um, well, why do you do this? And what do you tell a five-year-old? You know, I, so I said, well, Mikey, uh, daddy does this so he can buy you toys. I figured it, at least he could connect with that. He thought for a bit and then he said, dad, I don't need toys that bad. Made me think <laughs> it was worse than I thought. It's a lot of stress. And he was feeling the stress just listening to them next door. Um, so too many challenging cases, do we pace ourselves and how do we do that? Length of non-work stress. If you work hard, you got to play hard. What kinds of things do you do for yourself outside of the office? Next. The American Psychological Association says that we need to be aware of this effect on us and pace ourselves and find available hobbies or activities outside of your work. So I remember a number of years ago when my kids were small, I decided I was going to try cooking. And I was really excited about this. And so I started cooking for the family. Well, it, it didn't go over so well. It, it was uh, it, ended, it ended up like a skunk at a picnic because I, I wasn't very good at it. And so I, I kept trying, but the, the more I tried it, the worse it got. And um, after a while, the kids just started this, they started praying after the meal. So finally, my wife came to me and she said, look, this has got to stop. The kids are getting sick. It's not healthy for the family. And I, she said, you know, maybe you ought to find something like rock collection or something where you're not going to hurt anybody. Well, I should have taken lessons, but I didn't. But I learned some valuable stories, one of which is that I'll never be a good cook. I also learned that meatloaf isn't supposed to glow in the dark. And uh, if I want to stay close to my kids, I'll stop cooking. I told my 15 year old daughter one time to take out the garbage. She said, you cooked it, you take it out. So I stopped and I found another hobby, but finding something that you're really passionate about and you enjoy uh, or a couple things is a good balance from what we do. Most ethical principles mandate that mental health professionals strive to remain cognizant of their potential effects on their own physical and mental health and how that relates to our patients or clients. Next. Self-care and self-reflective practice are now recognized by American Psychological Association, and I believe the American Psychiatric Association and other associations as being a core competency uh, to be integrated in graduate training. I know they're doing this a lot in Canada and the United States. And efforts have been made to ensure that graduates uh, uh, trainings uh, in the field of mental health delivery are including this in their dynamics during their uh, early education. I know I preach that with our residents and fellows that pacing yourself and taking care of yourself, including not taking certain patients when we don't feel that it's a good fit or we don't particularly feel that we can handle that kind of an issue. Next. Um, recognizing early warning signals, uh, frequently feeling tired or irritable, 
arguing with others over minor issues, inability to relax, constantly feeling in demand or under pressure, lacking patience or tolerance, and compassion fatigue, particularly when we work with people that we don't particularly feel that we connect well with their problems. And people are coming with problems today that are you know, over the top, they're worse than they've been. I think since the pandemic, depression, anxiety is worse. And just value systems are different. I saw a guy a couple of weeks ago and he came in, he said, I got to see you, I got to see you. And I greeted him, I brought him in. I said, what's going on? He said, my marriage is on the rocks. I said, well, tell me what's, what's going on. He said, my wife broke up with her boyfriend. I thought I wasn't hearing him right. I said, You're, you want to say that again? He said, my wife broke up with her boyfriend. I said, your wife has a boyfriend? He said, yeah, that's the only way our marriage works. He said, she has a boyfriend. She's happy. I'm happy. She's off my back. I said, well, we, geez, we got to get your wife hooked up with Match.com immediately, I guess. And he said, well, could you see my wife and her boyfriend? I said, no, I can't see your wife and your boyfriend. You're my client. He said, yeah, but it would really help me if you did that. I said, look, I had to explain to him why that's unethical and why it's not a good idea and so on and so forth. Strange, but true. So what do we do when we don't really like our client or we don't like their attitude or their prejudices? And so do we keep it within the frame and work it therapeutically? Or do we, you know, say, look, I don't know if it's a good fit. And sometimes they're bad with boundaries. I can't, uh, you know, and I'll talk about that in a minute when we talk about some of the other issues next feeling as though they're insufficient time for yourself and family. And then you begin to resent it. And then you start to think about, hey, you know, this has got to do with I'm putting too much into work. Memory and concentration lapses. Lacking interest or a time for socialization and engaging in recreational activities. Feeling irritable, tired, unfulfilled, and at the end of the day, at kind of a loss. These are warning signs that you need to heed to next. Make a list of personal indicators of distress, changes in my behavior and attitude. Have I noticed that? Have other people noticed it? Is my thinking style, am I apathetic about what I'm doing? Comments from others about what they observe in me. I always listen to my wife and kids and my grandkids when they talk to me about, hey, you know, you're not yourself or you seem to be different lately. Differing reactions from others who know me. Differences in patients' responses to me as a therapist. And I know when I'm starting to drift because I may start to develop this apathy or resentment. A woman called me a couple of years ago and she said, Dr. Tilly, I have to come in to you. And I, I'm starting to hear voices again. And I thought, yeah, so am I. They're saying, retire, quit now, get out. No, it, that's the sign that I'm overwhelmed. Next. Some say, think about no full-time office at home. Now, that's been a hallmark for a lot of individuals over the years that they have some full-time, either full-time or part-time office at home. But a lot of research has started to show that it's better if you work somewhere away from where you live, sometimes in another city. Well, there's problems with it. Obviously, it's very attractive. You can work at home. You don't have a long commute. You can write off part of the house and it's more convenient and so on and so forth. But there are potential problems. I had a colleague about 20 years ago who had a home office. He was working with a woman. She had boundary issues, but difficult and challenging case. One day she comes in and she says, oh, I noticed the house next to you is for sale. He said, yeah, my neighbor is moving to Florida. And blah, blah. About two weeks later, she comes back and she says, I got wonderful news. What? We're going to be neighbors. She bought the house next to her therapist. I thought we were going to have to hospitalize the guy. He was really upset. What, what can you do? She's got a right to buy it. She didn't see any problem with the boundary. That's what he was treating her for. So there's pros and cons. That's one thing you need to think about, though. Do you want that close to your work where you live? Number two, meeting regularly with colleagues. Very, very helpful. I found that over the years, that was one of the highlights of my week. Fridays from 12 to 2, we'd have our lunch hour together. We told jokes. We exchanged stories. We got the, it was really wonderful and de-escalating. 
take expanded lunch breaks and take walks on nice days. No, so I'll tell my staff that I'm going out for you know an hour, uh, and they say you're coming back. I said yes, I'm coming back. Don't worry, but just get out, look at different scenery, breathe different air, talk to people. So it really helps to break up. Take breaks throughout the day. Very important. Mindfulness meditation and progressive muscle relaxation, excellent skills for reducing stress. And we at Harvard had some of the greatest uh, people on our staff that worked in the mind mindfulness field. Um, I almost said mindlessness, but that's a, probably a good character too. Sometimes when you have to clear your head uh, and you just spend some free time vegetating and doing very little of anything. We Italians have a beautiful saying, el dolce fa niente, the, the sweetness of doing nothing. Sometimes just having no plan, no idea what we're going to do, start out the day with no plans and you do whatever comes up there. That's wonderful Combine that with relaxation and mindfulness. Great way of de-stressing yourself. Next. Choose your patients carefully. Make sure this is a case that you're ready for or you can accommodate at this time. Look at your caseload. You know, is this going to be an added stress that I'm not going to be able to give adequate attention to? Number two, using your own tools to help yourself, like, Whatever it is, whatever approach you use, there's great all types of modalities, whether you're a cognitive behavior therapy or, or a, um, insight oriented or solutions focused, use some of those same techniques for yourself. You know, take a look at the things that you tell yourself and what your belief systems are about your work and help, helping others and taking care of yourself. Consider psychotherapy consultation for ourselves. Lots of people... Sometimes you're against this. They say, well, I've been through that. And, you know, where do I go? I know everybody. How do I do that? Hey, if we're overwhelmed and you're having trouble, some booster sessions or some limited sessions may be in the best thing of our interest. Next. So why do our members of our profession avoid getting psychotherapy? Not enough time. I'm busy schedule. Where am I going to set time? It's easier now with virtual. You can do that in the middle of the day and you can see somebody far away that you don't know. But that's one of the biggest complaints. Insufficient money, you got to make yourself worth spending the time and money to get into. Therapy, even if you don't want to use your insurance, you know, find it. Two, it's an embarrassment. If I'm a th treating therapist, why do I have to be in therapy myself? Because you're a human being because you have issues and problems like everybody else. And sometimes it's too much for us. Finding a therapist who's either neither a colleague or a mentor, again, with the uh, virtual stuff, we can you can see somebody in Canada if you want. They won't know you, you have that anonymity. So a lot of these complaints or excuses no longer hold water. It's a matter of doing it if you need it. Next. Guidelines for stress reduction. Watch for early signs of distress and take action as soon as possible. The longer you wait, the harder it is. Two, identify an external stressor. Uh, reduce those resources of distress when possible or alternatively do, develop some effective coping skills on how you're going to deal with it. Um, you know, we don't know uh, some of the, about so, the fact that some of the patients that we take on or clients that we take on are going to... Uh, uh, morph into some more serious uh, and, and, and challenging uh, uh, problems. And we, we just, that's part of what we do. So you have to make adjustments when this happens. Check out and, 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 and deal with any dysfunctional cognitions we have about ourselves and our ability to, to manage those kind of stressors. Next. We have to become an effective problem solver by brainstorming possible solutions evaluating the pros and cons and selecting the most feasible, putting them into action. And don't make self-esteem contingent on your work performance, okay? But trying to be effective, ethical, and uh, enjoy what we do next. And keep it in perspective. Uh, we may have a tendency to catastrophize about it. And sometimes we have to reroute it and rethink it. Make sure not to personalize the negative events too much and try to distance ourselves. When I was talking to the 
the Ukrainians and they were asking me, well, you know, like we're hearing these horrible, horrible things. And how do we keep from, you know, reacting to that as human beings and during the course of our role as mental health therapists? And so I came up with an analogy, like becoming a frozen sponge. And I gave them this little sponge with this face on it. And I said, look, sometimes you have to compartmentalize and only absorb so much to be empathetic, but not too much so that it deluges us. Obviously, these are horrible, horrible, tragic situations, but these people still need help and they still need our intervention and we need to be stable and keep you know, a, a cool head with that. So if you learn to compartmentalize some of it, that's maybe your best strategy. And, and they like this analogy of a frozen sponge because the one therapist said to me, I feel like a sponge and I get saturated and then I'm like, I'm no good. I'm useless. So we use that. And we talked about some of the stress inoculative and techniques that could be very helpful. Maintaining realistic expectations and avoiding the Messiah complex. Again, you can't save the world and you're only one person and you need to learn how to limit that. And a lot of times you find that it's people have guilt because they say they don't want to say no. I had a hard time saying no to a lot of the doctors across the street who really needed to see me because they were falling apart because of COVID and they were wearing masks and they were wearing shields and they're on this stuff and they're having a panic attacks. So I had one surgeon, she came home, she stripped all her clothes down before she walked in the house and she wiped everything down, including her bag because she had young kids. She was afraid of getting them sick. So, you know, this was, she was fragile at that point. So, you know, if you know, you don't have time, you have to triage them make up a team. We made up a team of people and some groups and did some innovative stuff, um, but you can't do it all yourself. Maintain realistic expectations are very important. Next. And again, set realistic uh, guidelines and goals for yourself. Uh, and, uh, you know, take that time for yourself. Plan to reduce or eliminate self-defeating behaviors that may develop as a result of that. And and again, sometimes short of therapy, meet with your colleagues, talk to them, um, you know, confide in them, see what they're doing, what we often share, how we cope and deal with this. It's, it's very helpful. Next. I use humor a lot as well. That's very important. In our field, sometimes it's easy to lose that. I use it in my therapy. I use it with my colleagues. I use it in my presentations. Um, try to take a lighthearted moment with it. It's very important. And keep that balance. Yes, next. And develop a personalized emotional fire deal, a plan in advance for strategies. What happens when I do get too overwhelmed or I have my own issues at home, whether it's with family or with my health or with anything else? How are we going to work with that and how are we going to deal with it? Uh, we always have that sense that we don't want to abandon clients or patients that we work with, but sometimes letting them know that, you know, we're human and we have some personal issues that need to be addressed and we have to take that time for ourselves. Next. So we take that compassionate attitude towards ourselves um, and our family, looking after ones in terms of rest, diet, exercise. Those are also important too. Um, I realized recently I'm drinking too much coffee during the day, so I changed the decaf or split it. Uh, it was wiring me up too much. Or self-soothing or relaxation activities. I take When I take a break, sometimes I do some meditation and do some relaxation. Works worlds for helping you deal with the, the stress. And adjusting the balance of life activities. Again, that ratio to reward with regard to you, play, you work hard, you play hard. We try to take a trips every three, four months somewhere, even if it's short. And I've been doing a new thing now. I lock my cell phone away uh, when I go away for so many days and we check in with it so that we're not deluged by texts or emails or whatever. It really helps you disengage and think about other things and focus on what we're doing. As the mindfulness people say, we stay in the moment and enjoy it. Next. I also recommend coming up with a list of past activities that you find relaxing or doing with other people uh, and, uh, you know, look at uh, incorporating that into your regular routine. And again, 
realizing when you need, you need help for yourself, work on dealing with any uh, negative thoughts about that whole idea, uh, losing control of ourself or uh, being a failure in any ways. It's not, it's just part of being human. Next. Again, that sort port system for oneself. Uh, you know, I asked one therapist, I said, you know, how do you deal with the stress? He says, I get a lot of help from Jack Daniels. No, 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 not good. Again, it's deleterious about people, colleagues, your spouse, uh, without uh, deluging them with uh, all the troubles and stuff that you're going through. But having somebody to be able to talk to about the stress that you experience is very important. And if necessary, don't be against seeking some professional uh, help for yourself. Tune-ups, checks, sometimes are very, very good and very helpful. Okay, next. These are a, a list of references that I have. I know I went through those very quickly, but um, I think you'll have everything on these references that you need. I also have an article that I published in the field. If you want, email me. I'll be happy to send it to you. Uh, and uh, above all, Think this through very carefully and ask yourself today after this, this seminar, you know, am I taking care of myself in the manner and my family in the way that I deserve? Uh, and am I making my work as, uh, and my personal life this uh, a priority in the manner that, that it should be? Because our, our health is vital and taking care of ourselves is very, very important. Uh, you'll appreciate it in the end. All right, so I think we're gonna open it up the next 10 minutes for any questions or comments uh, that anyone has. I see that we have some statements in the chat. So I think we're gonna have somebody speak to us. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dutilio. That was very insightful. Um, I have one comment here that um, Margarita uh, put in there. Unfortunately, clinicians who work in agencies do not get to choose their clients, what do we do? Yes, excellent, excellent question. And I did work for an agency 35 years ago, uh, MHMR, Mental Health Profession. And uh, yes, well, so when you don't have a choice and you, and you truly don't have a choice, and I think ethically, if you get somebody that you're feeling some tension with or it's not a good fit and you can't sit down with the staff or with the director and explain that ethically, you know, I, I have an obligation to see if somebody else wouldn't be a better fit for this. Then I think we have to uh, recognize what our limits are with working with them and try to focus on just certain aspects of their problems uh, that we can deal with. Uh, and then uh, perhaps consider some group therapy for them which may help take a little bit of that pressure off with you, or um, you know, they if they request to see someone else uh, because uh, it's a gender issue or a uh, 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 some feeling that they don't connect, then possibly you got to look at that. But if not, sometimes you just have to do the best that you can. Um, I hope that modern agencies today aren't that rigid that they won't listen to you if you have a good reason for why you can't work with them. Um, but it that's difficult. And I think that you've got to try to minimize the distress about, you know, your difficulty with them and do what you can. But I would, wouldn't would stop bringing it up at a staff or team meeting and talk about the, the ethics of it. Uh, but that's an excellent question. Um, you know, you just, you got to minimize and do the best that you can with them. And I don't, I don't know if anyone else has comments about that, but that's a pretty difficult issue. Uh, pretty good, difficult situation because. Uh, yeah, uh, I yeah. don't see any other questions in the chat. So, but uh, those who might want to speak up, please unmute yourself and. Um, yeah, I have uh, I have my hand up. Um, my name is Dr. Baker, uh, Joyce Baker. When you mentioned that you use humor, um, I've seen sort of two sides of that. Sometimes it can lighten things, but at other times patients can feel that you're not taking them seriously uh, and it can backfire. What are your thoughts about that? Well, excellent question, uh, point as well. Yes, it can. You have to be very careful how you do that. 
Um, so if I, I, I try to use humor sometimes, not with them about their issues, but I'll, I'll give an example or an analogy. And I'm a cognitive behavior therapist. So uh, I, I, my therapy is a, is a little bit different than some of the more traditional or the, the dynamic uh, therapies where I might uh, use an example uh, that I've experienced and I'll try to use some humor in a light kind of a way, um, but uh, not a way that it would be misinterpreted. But you must be very, very careful because sometimes, and if you get that feedback that they don't like that or you're you're uh, demeaning them or demeaning the situation, then you got to heed to that and be conscientious. And, and then maybe don't use humor if they're sensitive to it. Uh, yeah, because sometimes they'll be afraid or intimidated to say to you, you know, I don't like what you just did, or this makes me feel what you did just makes me feel yada yada because of the power dynamics, and and they don't want you to not like them, or you know. That's right, and and if they say that, I, I thank them for that honesty and that insight, and and right out say I I missed, I may have missed that, and I, and I. It's my fault if I did. It certainly wasn't uh, aimed at, at demeaning anything. And I want to encourage you to speak up when you feel that way, because it's very important. So I try to make it grist for the therapeutic mill and talk about, you know, a little bit about why they feel that way and why they may have some difficulty speaking up and they're intimidated because it parallels somewhere to issues in their life. But you got to be very tactful. Tact and diplomacy is very important. Uh, I saw some other hands up. Margarita has a question and then Harold. Harold. Uh, Harold. Uh, uh, thank you. I think uh, Margarita was, was before me, but if, if, if I may go ahead and uh, 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 just ask a very quick question. First, Frank, thank you so very much uh, for your, your thoughtful presentation. You so you remind me so much of Bob Seder we both knew, who always treated people with dignity and humility. And I'm sure that's incredibly helpful for, um, for your patients. Um, one concern that patients in the healthcare professions often share is that somehow their privacy will be invaded in the uh, licensing or relicensing process and varies to some extent state by state, but it's a particular concern uh, to people who license in multiple states. Um, I think we're pretty good here in Massachusetts about protecting people's privacy in terms of the licensing process, but uh, and across the disciplines, from what I can tell. But it, it, it does vary. How, how, um, so I think it's it's important to be able to address that concern from the very beginning. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? No, I agree with you. I I, I agree with you 100%. I think that's got to be addressed right, right off the bat. And, and ferreted it out because you're right, it, it, it can be an issue. Uh, and that's that's an excellent point. No, I agree with you 100%. Okay. Yeah. And, and I also wanna say one other thing that, that the doctor who brought up about the humor, um, you know, I had a, I had a, a supervisor, uh, I was supervising a, a young therapist one time and he was upset because he tried to make a joke and it backfired. And a, and the woman, uh, his patient one time was upset and she was questioning whether or not he really cared. And she said, I, I think you only do this for the money. And he said, well, of course I do it for the money. You think I do this for free? He thought it was funny, but boy, that really flattened her and she left. Uh, and he said, look, I was a joke. I wasn't trying to, I said, listen, you, gotta, you better know your cookie before you make a joke like that. And then you need to weigh it out, whether it's cynical and how it always think about how it's going to be interpreted by the client or the patient, not how you interpret it, but how are they going to perceive this? Very, very important. Yes. Margarita. You're muted. I don't know if anybody's good at lip reading, but I, I we can't hear uh, Marita. Yeah, I had been take I had taken these off uh, okay. the, the what, headphones what while I was listening. Uh, well, what um, mean? Yes, so uh, you know I've been training uh, clinicians and supervisors for many years, and you know a lot of the strategies that we typically teach, like the ones that that you've presented, are um, things that the individual can do, but. 
I think that organizations have a responsibility to develop cult organizational cultures that support that self-care. And I think that we're in a moment right now that given the, the workforce crisis that we're in in behavioral health, um, the administrators are between a rock and a hard place in terms of having all the, you know, not enough uh, workforce and having increasing demand for services. And I think that, you know, the pressures are on both sides and they're prioritizing services to clients and asking clinicians to do more and more rather than, you know, um, you know, to the detriment of, of sometimes the clinician's well-being. So I think that we're in a really difficult place. And I think it's important for organizations to think about that because, you know, all the consequences for the service, the quality of the services are going to be affected by, you know, the well-being of the of the workforce. And so it's a tension that is heightened at this particular moment. Absolutely, Margarita. Excellent point. And, and I think post-COVID, everybody's full. I've never heard so many people saying we're not taking new patients or we, we've got long waiting lists. I mean, it is, there's just not enough therapists to, accom to accommodate everyone. So you're, you're absolutely right. And I hope, you know, that things change in the future because it's, uh, it's tough right now. Okay, anyone else have a comment? Or these are excellent, excellent comments. Uh, this is great. I can tell everybody's very seasoned. I would like to say something. Yeah, go ahead, Maria. Yes, I'm, I'm here at, at Mass Mental, and something that I have found that happens in this building that is very good for self-care is that there is a program, the Warm uh, Clinic Center, and they offer a once a week, one hour of Qigong and staff is invited to join. Oh, and nice. I have found that that is, at least for me as a therapist, that is fantastic. And it's right in the middle of the week, it's Wednesdays in the afternoon. And, and that is a resource that is already in place that I found very, very like good for self-care. Yes, that's great. And and the, the facilities today are much better than they were 25 years ago when I first came there and we had the old Massachusetts Mental Health Center, which was uh, very old and uh, kind of decrepit. And I remember the, the first time I went into the restroom I, uh, to use the toilet and steaming hot water came out of it. I thought, I I don't think I need to, to use this. <laughs> it was really an old building. Um, and uh, there was uh, one of the residents uh, uh, had a psychotic patient that he was working with. And uh, and they, the doctor asked him about, you know, have you had any hallucinations? Well, he said, I, I'm hallucinating now. I, I I see a mouse climbing into your coffee cup. And the, the doctor looked over and there was really a mouse climbing into his coffee cup. It wasn't a hallucination. So you, the, the facilities and the, the camaraderie, I think, has, has gotten much, much better over the years. And that's wonderful. I, I've got very fond memories of my years there because I, I've always felt everybody was very down to earth. Uh, you know, and uh, it it's uh, was very. Uh, I, I have warm feelings from that, so that's great, and I'm I'm glad you're enjoying that. So we are at uh, one o'clock. Um, since there are no other questions that I see on the chat, um, I want to thank you, Dr. Detilio, for this wonderful presentation, and great to have you back. Yeah, thank you for having me, and it's an honor always. Okay, bye bye. And okay. just wanted to remind everyone to please fill out the post event survey that I sent in the chat and I will also email it out to all participants after this. Great. Thank, Thank you, Lola. You.